Yeah, Russell, um, we're back at it again. Uh, I'm very, very excited for this new thing that you and I have sort of putting together, yeah, because um, I think it's needed, eh? I think it's needed in the game in, in a way that so many things in this world is being pulled apart and, you know, you, you see young cricketers already under so much pressure at times from parents and from coaches and schools and bursaries and scholarships. And I mean, there, there's so, so many directions that you can pull this thing in, right? That's what's immediately in, at the top of my head. And um, I, I think it's just so important to delve into this, this idea of what the spirit of cricket actually is and how it applies and how do we do it, right? Because I think at times it's a bit vague when you actually read to read the document um, and everybody sort of tries to make sense of it and I am very excited to be unpacking this with you as a sort of ongoing project that you and I have committed to to say hey how do we get how do we get better at this right and to start this conversation I thought to just read from the MCC manual out the preamble you know about what is the spirit of cricket and it says Cricket owes much of its appeal and enjoyment to the fact that it should be played not only according to the laws, but also within the spirit of cricket. The major responsibility for ensuring fair play rests with the captains, but extends to all players, match officials, and especially in junior cricket, which is a passion of mine, um, the teachers, the coaches, and the parents. So ultimately, it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that we play the game and do the game in the right spirit. And like I said, I'm looking forward to uh, unpacking this with you a little bit further. Uh, where's your head at with this? Like, what's your initial thoughts and, you know, the things that you might want to communicate as we get going with this? Thanks very much, Jody. Um, firstly, let me thank you for for wanting to have this conversation. Uh, it is uh, it's something that's a, a very deep, passionate area of mine um, that I've, I've noticed in the game for a long time, and I've seen what the MCC manual referring to there this appeal of the game. Right, I kind of saw the appeal of the spirit of the game early. Uh, firstly, I actually noticed where it was missing more than where it was actually alive and and being. Uh, produced. So the appeal was actually a lackluster one when I originally saw that people were violating the spirit going after things where they've lost the sense of the spirit of the game. And I've noticed this time after time. So I came a little bit disillusioned by watching the game at a professional level and also therefore the effect that it had on, you know, on everyone participating in it, whether they are, you know, aspiring cricketers or, or someone who's just a casual observer of the game. You know, I think that we we, um, that point in time, I think that first love of the game, you know, is missing or is lost at times. And we kind of get distracted into a whole bunch of other things, you know, and I call it the sideshows of the game. And um, for me, the spirit of the game, it's the core essence of where everything started. Hence, uh, you started by mentioning the MCC preamble. There. This is almost like, um, you know, page naught. It's like uh, the first part of uh, before you actually get into the make makings of, of what the game is all about. So you don't even get into the rules or the laws as in, it's in cricket, but you start with the preamble where it says, yes, we're going to start unpacking the laws. But before we do that, we need to acknowledge that the spirit of the game is before everything, right? Now, the, the exciting thing for me, I'm going to make this premise early and upfront. The exciting thing for me is I firmly believe that, uh, um, that if you obey the spirit of the game, if you play according to the spirit of the game, you wouldn't even need the laws. The laws would actually just dissipate. It would be something that will just be kept, right? It fulfills the laws, if, if you want to call it that. So if you're truly playing according to the right spirit, uh, the, the spirit of the game, right? This intuitive sense that we all have of, of, of a sense of fairness, a sense of respect, a sense of love of the game, right? If you play according to that, we wouldn't need laws to govern and control or, or you know, to keep things in order. And for me, that's the biggest advantage or the appeal of what the spirit of the game is all about. And hence, I've kind of always been some, somewhat of a strong advocate championing this cause of spirited cricket or the spirit of the game, spirit of cricket. 
And for me, that is something that I think uh, the conversation needs to deepen. And also just maybe the language needs to change somewhat so that we bring that as an option to the game. Because I think we forgot about it for most part with all the other forms of distraction. And specifically for our youngsters and the future of the game in which, in which direction it's going. So that, I mean, I said quite a bit there, but I mean, that's just my passion and how I came into it. And for the most part, I think that's what makes this conversation, even in of itself, quite appealing to me. So if you say um, if you say you're disillusioned, right? Is there is there a specific sort of example that maybe that you can give about that? Yeah, I think uh, when it comes down to um, the way the game is actually administered, right? If you look at it from a professional point of view, it normally comes through quite strongly because everything is now ceremonialized or or institutionalized, put structures around it, and it becomes official. Particularly if the high you go, let's say test cricket as an example, as the major appeal. Everyone wants to wear kind of their number ones when they go to the field. Everything is prim and proper. You look at Lords as an example of the history of the game and all of that, right? So everything is structured in such a manner. And as a result of it, we tend to forget. We kind of make it all about, and I'm not I'm saying this respectfully, all the gimmicks around the game. We make it about all those things. Uh, the fact that there's now battle against battle. And we kind of create this marketing uh, enormity of it all, right? Uh, and we're looking for the clash between this top player versus that top player in the teams. And we lose sight of the true essence or the spirit of it, right? I looked at it once, and I don't need to run campaigns down or, or competitions down. But sometimes when you have side events to try to enhance the campaign, my competition is better than your competition. And then I'm saying... Surely the game in and of itself has true uh, cherishable value that you wouldn't need to go and add additional things onto it, right? You wouldn't need to market it or sell it in any way. It's almost a product that sells itself. And I think this is where the purists come into play when they start saying, no, the new version of T20 is not cricket, you know, as an example. You know, people say the true sense of cricket is test cricket, you know, because now there's a little bit more purified and back to its roots, back to its originality. And I think a lot of those, the, the leaning towards uh, these make make uh, the trending things, the make uh, we, we're creating more of a make believe, not make believe, but more of these manufactured versions of the game. And I think that's where the disillusionment comes into play because we, then we make it about that, that that is the objective of of why we engage with the game, whether a spectator or participant, or even just a support to the game, right? If we involve in the game in a professional manner. From a work point of view. So I think that's where my disillusionments came from because in being part of, and this is part of my personal story, professional teams and chasing, call it the cup, the prize reward of, of all our hard labor and work. And in actually achieving that objective, sometimes it feels like an empty feeling, right? And I'm wondering to myself with all this hype that was created from season to season, how much does it really have uh, a sense of fulfillment? Does it really bring satisfaction? Does it really bring fulfilling? Does it hit the mark that we were actually aiming at? I think that's where the disillusionment comes from because ultimately you keep the laws as best as we can. We play the best version of the game. We, we, we you know, maximize our potential. We, we really show our true uh, talent and capabilities and we get the objective accomplished. We still left a little bit empty unfortunately, but that doesn't get announced to, to the public or we kind of suffer in silence on that. And I think that, the, you know, the answer or the, the saving aspect here is actually when we go back to our first love of the game. Why did we actually get engaged with the game? And this is where this disillusionment has brought me back to the spirit of the game. In the spirit of the game, in my view, is where you find fulfillment in and of itself. And, and we don't necessarily, in modern, ga modern day game, we don't necessarily pay much attention to it. I mean, you, you would probably know this to be true. You can probably confirm or deny this. But for the most part, if you look at any forms of competition, the spirit of the game is mentioned right at the beginning of the tournament, where, we, where the teams commit to say, um, so and so, we are committing to play by, by the spirit of the game, right? It's not defined, but we all kind of have an, uh, an assent to what it is, right? And then at the very back end, after the competition is complete, after how many weeks or months, whatever, 
then we start saying, okay, so who won the award? Or which team is going to be awarded the Spirit of, of Cricket Award, right? And that's when it gets announced again. So in between the, the competition, none of the spirit of the game is really brought up unless there were incidents where there's a violation of the spirit of the game. But for the most part, it's just relegated to the beginning and then the very end. And I think that's where the disillusionment comes from. As you're speaking, I'm sort of thinking quite a lot, uh, and not that that's necessarily a good thing, right? <laughs> because then sometimes it means we don't listen carefully. But and I and I think I'm going to echo some of the words that you said. But I get the sense that it really is about why we play, right? Why are you getting involved with this game? Okay, is it is it because you just want to get something from the game? Or is it because you actually want to play the game because you really just love the game and you love being involved with it um, and you love the competition? Um, so my head went sort of into two places, right? And I don't know if it's um, that relevant to get this specific at this point in time in our conversations, but my head went into two different places. And so the, the first place it went was the elite cricketer that's trying to like build a career out of the game. And, and what that actually means to them if they, if they buy into this idea of playing within the spirit and that that's the starting point, the starting point is not your career. The starting point is not the money you're going to earn and what your next contract is going to be. The starting point is just the spirit of the game, right? And, and, and wanting to be almost like a protector of that as you go. And then, then I think of, as I wrote down here, Vern winning versus the spirit of the game, you know? Like, is it winning sort of naturally makes people want to be part of something? So like, you've got a cricket academy. If my cricket academy produces good cricketers, we win competitions, we win tournaments, then naturally more people want to come join us. It's a big driver sort of for something like that. If I score more runs and I take more wickets, then naturally I'm going to be bought into the next league or play test cricket for my country one day. And so I think a lot of people struggle with this conundrum between the hardness of performance and the maybe inverted commas, softness of something like the spirit of cricket. It's the soft skill. It's the thing we can't really touch. It's the thing we can't hold in our hands where runs stand in a scorebook on a piece of paper. I can see it up on a big board. So I, there's physical evidence for it where the soft skills is the, 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 the spirit of cricket talks to the, uh, the, the spirit is the only word I can use. The spirit, the ethos, the ethics through which you look to score runs through which you look to take wickets, right? And so there's this high performance end of this conversation where I think it's a tough one at times, right? Because of that. And then there's the flip side where I'm thinking of the developing cricketer, the one that's still busy coming through the system that has the hopes and the dreams and wants to aspire to be something or someone one day within the sport. And I, and I think of, how easy it is and how much pressure is created in focusing on the hardness of the performance versus the softness of the spirit of the game. And, and I think there's a conundrum for cricketers, right? Well, that's what I find at times is the conundrum is, well, how am I going to perform if I don't focus on performance? But at the same point in time, if we're focusing on performance, we're just creating more pressure for it to actually happen and you inevitably don't. And so I think that's what really has me fascinated in exploring this conversation with you more is I come from that mental angle where I, I can see the, the, the dangers of making it just about the performance and the laws and, you know, the rights and the wrongs and the goods and the bads. Am I holding the bat right? Even if you go into skill, right? Because it just, it's, a, it's a mindset that starts to permeate everything. How your skill develop, how you, am I making the right choice here? Versus saying, I come from a different place. I come from the place of the being of the game, not the doing of the game. And, you know, and, and so I'm wondering what your sort of take is on this whole winning versus the spirit 
angle, right? Yeah, I think the uh, kind of upfront people presume that it's binary in a way, right? That it's either or. You can either win or you play by its spirit. Particularly the, uh, as you said, guys who are contracted who are professional elite. They tend to say that this is now contractually bound to do great performances. So at a certain point, they have to surrender to the, or kind of relegate the spirit in a way in order to maybe accomplish certain things. Often then, as I said, part of the disillusionment would be the spirit of the game only comes up when there's a transgression, when there's actually a violation of the law somehow. Then people incite the spirit of the game as a kind of retributive thing. We need to create or change something. We need to correct something. So we only really bring it back in when there's some certain fault found within the game where there's a transgression. And then no one wants to deal with it because now all of a sudden the spirit is violated and we need to kind of protect its purity because the assumption is that this ideal, this idealistic aspiration that we have, that the game is pure and therefore we have to subscribe to this, call it code or standard, right? That none of us is going to fall short of that. And if we do, we quickly want to clean it up. Even in our pursuit of, of as you said, winning or, and achieving and uh, all of those sorts of ambitious things, right? However, this is the thing. It's not binary, as I said earlier. It can be both. One doesn't have to have sacrifice ambition or accomplishment by engaging with the spirit of the game. In fact, the, your, your greats of the game will probably be uh, inclined to be greats purely because they've had both running at the same time. They had a, an expression or personification of the spirit of the game, as well as achieving the highest end of objectives. And those are the ones that we truly uh, kind of relish in our society or in terms of contributors of this game, right? Um, you know, we can bring up different names, um, but the point is, if there's a certain justness that comes through in the way you play the game, then those are the things that are appealing as much as the excellence that you portrayed, the manner in which you demonstrated your skill set. So this is the thing that now you have uh, kind of... Um, the best of both worlds. You have the justness that comes through and you have the excellence of the guy's talent that comes through. And obviously the objective, the trophy that confirm both. Whereas we all know that someone can win a trophy, but he did it in an unjust means. Yes, he's acknowledged as the champion, but he's not the people's champion per se because he done it in an unjust manner. Or there's this underlining thing where we feel, is he really a hero or is he somewhat of an anti-hero? And we've just become accepting of it. So therefore, it's almost a tarnishing of the spirit. So it's not really safeguarding the spirit in a sense. We've kind of softened it and allowed those sort of uh, underlining things. Now, the, the, the reality is these things are abstract by nature. And this is why it gets relegated, because we can't necessarily see it. As you said, it's not the black and white that runs on the board, you know, all those sort of tangible engagements that we have with the game. But the abstract side of the game is the thing that, that we need to pay even close attention to because we don't see it that obviously. And the thing actually derails us. Hence, we ask the question of what spirit are you of? What's your motive? What's your why? Why are you engaging with these things? And you need to keep that monitoring. And no, most often, it is not one own self that is able to do that in terms of safeguarding it because you can lose yourself very easily chasing and pursuing things and not even knowing what's, what's your motive, your driver, right? It's only through maturity of the relationships, your teammates, or the game itself that monitors and helps you stay on the, call it the narrow path of the spirit of the game, right? And this is why it's there. So the spirit of the game, it's put in its preamble because it is something that we need. Otherwise, we lose our way. We tend to actually take each other out without realizing it. And we lose our way and we turn into this green monster, if you want to call it, that's chasing this goal and chasing the appeal. And for the moment, the spirit of the game is the only real thing that will keep you on the straight and narrow. And it can create excellence too, right? So I'll use an example. I'm going to just use it off my head. A Viv Richards, for instance. We're not saying he had a perfect personal life, but we knew that he played for a particular cause, right? That was a just cause in a way, right? As an example, I'm just using that as an easy example. But he also had one of the most expressive talents out there, right? The most bravest expressions of the game. No helmet. He took on, you could bowl him and bounce him in the face. He'll take on the next ball and did for six. 
that's sheer, sheer talent and bravery, right? And because of that inner strength that drove him to do that external exploits. So for me, when you have both, the game is escalated in what you refer to insanely good. People become insanely good because their talent is maximized and the inner strength through the spirit of the game is maximized because they're playing from a just space. So the idealism of the spirit of the game can be not just a starting point, but a continuation point, a driver, a sustainer, a god, a narrow road to accomplish all that we seek to accomplish and more because we'll be able to amaze ourselves with what we can accomplish if we play according to the right spirit. But it's not spoken about, so it's not given at actually a credence and option. And as a result of it, we're missing out on what the originality was, why the original thought was to put it in its preamble. It has a huge appeal. And I think this is why this dialogue for me, it's so empowering. So I called it uh, the good news of the preamble, right? And we know whenever you hear good news, what do you do? You feel good, right? It makes you feel good. And I don't think we have this good news echoed well enough because people are not feeling good about the spirit of the game. They feel like it's an intrusion. Oh, you're inciting the spirit of the game because someone you're just you're just being uh, jealous because someone else got an advantage over you. Someone else got uh, a run out, and you feel this is against the spirit or whatever, right? And so, therefore, they only use the spirit of the game for the retribution, whereas the true essence, actually, of the spirit of the game is the restorative, is to restore relationships, is to restore the love of the game, is to restore one back to that straight and narrow. That will give you both excellence internally and externally. And I think that's where we're missing out on the real appeal of the spirit of the game. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I like that. I like everything about what you just said there and sort of my my brain floated in and around as it does with these things. But as you spoke there, I sort of the, the image that came to my head, right? Um, and, and maybe this makes it it's a, maybe a little bit of a practical example. But the image that came to my mind was two teams arrive at a game. And I've, I've often been in this situation, right? It's, I get a feeling on the inside where you know you're going to go play against a team. And hey, maybe they feel the same about me. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I, I don't think any of us are, are. But you arrive at a game. And you almost have this feeling about this team or about that coach that say something like, geez, these guys are just cheaters, eh? Like, you know, you just know that if, if the ball's going to hit my batters on the pad, they're going to give it out. If it's going to hit the, their batters on the pads, they're not going to give it out. As an example, right? It's a very silly thing where if both teams arrived with truly an embodiment of the spirit of the game, you wouldn't have that. That, that, like that type of thing wouldn't appear. It would be more like we are to play in the right spirit. We know you are here to play in the right spirit. Let's go have the greatest, freaking, most phenomenal, awesome game that we can have. Also understanding that as humans, we make mistakes. As humans, errors come up as, you know, like that's a, I don't think we must sort of take that out of the equation, but there's a difference between it being done with malice and with ill intent and with it just being sort of a run of the mill. Uh, well, I thought it was out, you know, I didn't hear the inside edge on the pad. Almost like, sorry that I did that. Um, you know, at least you go home and you reflect on it afterwards because you go, shucks, was I, was I doing the right thing there versus sort of arriving ahead of time and you already have this sort of weird feeling about the game because of some reputation that precedes somebody. And, and, and I think that speaks directly to the spirit of the game, you know? And then, and then like the second thing you mentioned there that I thought was pretty cool was talking about the teams and how they are. Geez, here we go again, right? But then I wonder how often do teams actually, I can certainly say in any team, at a professional level that I was involved with, other than say the values and the things that we determined for ourselves, other than that, I don't think we necessarily um, checked in on like, is this stuff in line with the spirit of the game? Firstly, I don't think we did anything like that. And secondly, I, 
I can see that there could be a huge amount of value, right? Now, I'm not going to use your exact words yet, but it's like, I think you said something like, with what spirit are you arriving? You know, like, how is it that you're showing up? And, and that, to a certain extent, is mental performance, right? It's the work I do as a mental performance coach to help people identify who, who they are at their best. And often when we're at our best, we're more aligned with the spirit of the game. We're more aligned with our truer sense of self, where it's not about competing with other people and trying to one-up other people and try and like, you know, do things in an underhanded way or anything like that. It would be to play the game hard and fair, say, or, you know, I want to feel the competition. I want to be in here, but I want to know that I've come out on top in a just way. And and I think more work can definitely be done then. More work can definitely be done with cricketers to communicate this message, this good news message about the spirit of the game, because there's only performance benefits, right? I think there's only performance benefits down the line, right? It's maybe not the how we want this conversation to go. My head always goes to this, right? Always the performance angle, the skill angle, the development angle. I suppose maybe that's a part of my spirit, right? I lean heavily into that type of stuff. And I can only see performance gain if cricketers are willing to sit down and say, right, let's look at the spirit in which we approach this. You know, why am I actually here? Am I here because I just want to get something from the game? Because I just want to buy that nice house by the beach? Uh, for the young cricketer, do I just want to have the shine of what I think it's like to be a professional cricketer? You know, I just want to be able to say I live the dream. Um, you know, like, why is it that you're actually getting involved? Or are you getting involved because you want to grow the game, because you want to uh, evolve the game? And so I think there's this unique opportunity that exists. And you and I spoke about this sort of as we were busy prepping for this. Um, we, we spoke about the, and these are the words that sort of kept on sticking with me. And it's my main reason for wanting to have these conversations with you is that we can learn to play the game differently, that we can change the game in some way through having these conversations. And that people that are listening in and hearing them can go into their environments and change the way the game is played. That we're not just playing from this, I don't know what to call that place. You know, I don't have a specific name for it, but maybe a neediness. You know, like it's a it's a needy place. Like I need the money. I need my career. I need the next level. I I, I need to score runs so that I can keep my contract. Right. I, the, a lacking, needy, just doing. You know, kind of part of the game or place to play from versus versus coming from a spirit, coming from a sense of being, coming from a sense of. Uh, greater things that are beyond and 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 the reality is that can only be felt for me that's my sense about it it can only be felt by each individual because it's not a tangible thing it's not a thing that you can hold in your hands so it is at times a thought it is at times a feeling it is at times an intention or a focus an approach more than it is uh, a doing but I think once we are clear on that intention, once we are clear on that approach, we know that intention drives behavior. Intention, belief drives performance. Intention drives performance. The inner game drives the external game. And so I think when we come from the right, in inverted commas, spirit, because there's no necessarily right one way, but when we come from a spirit that I think is aligned with the preamble of the laws of the game, and we are really in the game for that, then I can only see good things coming from that because the game takes care of itself. You know, in a hundred years from now, who knows? Maybe we just play two over cricket <laughs> with teams of four. I don't know how the game's going to evolve. <laughs> I don't know how the game's going to evolve. Batters walk out to face one ball, but the game, is, the game will continue right? The game will continue to be there and the essence of the game will remain no matter how the formats change, no matter how the game evolves. Um, I th and, and so I think long after you and I or anybody else who's listening to this are, have left this world, I think the, 
the spirit of the game is something that survives everybody. And we're either adding to that, you know, we either we either playing our part to add to that essence and that spirit, or we're playing a part where we harm it in some way. And I think when we harm it, we're pushing people away from a beautiful game. There's parts of the world where it's busy growing and there's parts of the world where it's not. You know, like in South Africa, I think the game is under huge amounts of pressure. The you know, schools that used to have eight cricket teams at under 14 now have two or three. You know, fields are getting less and less. Even though there might be a hype around T20 and the SA20 and these sort of things that could pe pull people in, but at lower levels, the game is not as healthy as we often think it is. And I think a huge part of that is that sometimes it's not nice to engage with the game because it's just, you know, it's a mean experience for some people. And I think if we can like harness this idea of the spirit of cricket, we can actually grow the game. We can get people involved in the game. We can get people who want to love the game, who want to play the game because they enjoy the game, not because they need something from it or, you know, they desire to have this game do this thing for them. It's more, I'm here in the spirit and I'm going to do this for the game. I'm going to contribute in this way. I'm going to add value in a way. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's a lot to get excited about. I think that's a lot of good news that, you know, the game doesn't have to be this horrible experience for you. You know, the game can be a phenomenal experience. We don't have to see teams lose on the world stage and break down and cry because they didn't get from the game what they wanted. You know, they can celebrate the phenomenalness of the win or the loss with the same energy and enthusiasm because it's not about that so much. It's about the, I think if we shift our focus to the spirit of the game, then it becomes more about, wow, what a, what a beautiful celebration of the game. No? Again, well done to you. Unlucky to us. Let's move on. Let's, let's find the next expression of the spirit. And I, I think, I think that's a wonderful thing. That's my sense about it. Just about to comment when you said there, uh, what about, God forbid, the, the uh, kind of huge applause for your opposition winning it over you? You know, that's a true reflection of the spirit when, when you've been defeated, but you know that your opposition are deserved winners uh, and you can stand there fully uh, engaging with the spirit in such a manner that on this day, you personified it better and you deserve the glory more than us. You know, then you're truly flowing in the spirit. And imagine that day when it does come. I mean, we didn't really have it. I think one of the experiences I really came close to it must have been, um, I keep referring to it, the, the last World Cup with England winning, uh, the prior one against New Zealand. That was a pretty unique game of cricket. Uh, however, I think the way the game was officially decided made it a little bit of sour taste in the mouth. It was a beautiful game. It was swaying left, right, and center. Players giving their all. And there was brilliant expressions. You know, you didn't quite know who was going to be capped as winner at the end of the day. But then because of the laws that came into it and how they actually administered that laws, it left a sour taste, in my view. And this is why I feel like we missed out on a better experience and an outcome um, that could actually pro you know, progress the game in a positive light. I just wanted to echo also, Jody, the sentiments you had about peak performance um, and, and uh, excellence that comes as a result of flowing in the spirit. I think the kind of assumption is that you won't have, you, you kind of will become soft. And I think you alluded to it when you have that expression of play hard and play fair. The spirit of the game really is, in a nutshell, in my view, if I were to define it somewhat, that spirit is about the love of the game. Love has to be put at the center of it. What has drawn you in? That first love that you once engaged with the game, whether it was you picking up a mini cricket bat you know, in South Africa, uh, you know, softball, or you're just playing in a park or on the beach with, or in the backyard, wherever, in the streets for some kids, Wherever you engage with the game, that's your first love. And that's what you used to get excited about, you know, leaving school early maybe in the afternoons after doing your homework or whatever, wanting to play the game, or just wanting to get down to the nets and wanting to try and experience a little bit more of the game, right? That first love is the spirit of the game. And we tend to relegate that. The first love is the thing that we keep having to draw ourselves back to, the love of the game. 
So how do we, like in any relationship, how do we enhance this love that we share with the game? And that is how you engage with it, right? And that's why if you look at it, and this is the good news of the spirit of the game, it's not just for a mediator to sit and say, uh, whether he's a match referee or a, uh, what do they call these, these judges who are adjudicating some false um, issues, right? Or maybe an umpire, player's umpire, who now needs to kind of make the calls and say out when you know it's not out. It just hits the pads, it's going down leg, but you're giving it out. You know what I mean? It's not about that harshness about judging it. It's about how do we enhance the love of the game between the recipients, between participants, between spectators? How do we make this experience of the game unique? Whether we're playing on an open field and there's like 10 games going on in between normal matches, you know, when you go to the Wonders, for instance, you'll find the play, the kids were, were allowed to go onto the field back in the day and they can just play. There's tons of games are going on around and they're loving it. They don't know where the ball is when they hit into the crowd, but they're loving it because that's the spirit of the game. I mean, it's just the love of the game and they want to try and demonstrate what their role models are like on the field doing it, you know. But n whatever age you get, get to and whatever sense of professionalism you become uh, down the line in your career, the love of the game tends to dwindle and you need to be intentional about reviving that love of the game and letting that lead you consistently. Don't let the side things uh, distract you from the true love of the game. So again, the play hard aspect, I think, was put in there because it seems like a soft thing when you talk about the love of the game. And I think that's where you don't have to sacrifice it. You can have love and be a hard person. You can have both. You can be firm and be loving. You can be fair and you can be loving. It's not one or the other. But I think we've been sacrificing this love aspect, right? And if you look at it in terms of the MCC, I know you read the first part, but all of, if you disinvestigate it, all of what is described there, respect, fairness, and the way you engage, right? Just accepting the umpire's decision, accepting your teammates, your captain, whatever, all of those things, every single one of them, are all referring to the relationship. The relationships we have with the game, the relationships we have with each other who are engaged with the game, and the relationships we have with people who are watching the game. It's all about the enhancement, the equity, as I constantly refer to, the relational equity that comes from enhancing that game, the, the relationships within the game, right? And that is why the good news of the spirit of the game, it's all about how do we have justice or justness in the game right? As opposed to who's right and wrong. It's not about who's right and wrong, trying to find fault and trying to say, I got one up ahead of you. I'm trying to advantage myself. No, it's about trying to find a way that we can celebrate the life and the love of this game together in the best amicable fashion so that we keep enhancing this engagement with each other. We keep adding to this love affair that we have with the game and with each other. And that's, it's, it's idealistic, but that's the beauty and the good news that we are talking about. And so much of this game is missing out because we don't have that aspect brought into it as much, right? We don't have it. And then I think people are yearning for that little aspect of the game to be brought in. Now, when I refer to, uh, I said something very strongly there, but when I refer to justice, when you hear the word justice, firstly, justice always, you can't have justice by yourself. It always is interrelational, right? It has to be between you and another. It got to do. It, it's always got to do with how you relate to each other. And if that relationship is tarnished because of an incident in the game, the justice or the spirit of the game says, "How do we make right what is seemingly a wrong here?" And both come out like victors, like more engaged, more tighter. That's what the justice is all about. So we, when we talk about justness and we have these adjudicators, whether they match referees or umpires or these uh, judges when there's the transgression, it's about trying to find the best amicable way to justice again so that we enhance tighter. But right now, we are not administering the game based on its spirit. We are actually leaning more towards its law. And that is what's creating more death and division. Because when we do that, when we take the law solely in and of itself and we relegate or we actually just push the spirit aside, we start bringing in criticism and division 
and call it uh, superiority one over the other. Because now we're trying to find fault and we're trying to create a separation between parties. So I'll use this practical example. If you on the road and traffic wise, right, and you see a police cop, right, a traffic cop, and he pulls you over for some other reason, are you expecting him to get up to your front window and say, excuse me, sir, I just want to applaud you for how well you've been driving on the road here. You've done a brilliant job. I just want to commend you on yes, yes, <laughs> the next whatever. You know, he doesn't come across and gives you a compliment like that. He's finding fault. So when we engage with the law in and of itself in a similar fashion, we are engaging with fault finding and we are creating more division and threatening the equity of relationships. And we are threatening the love of the game. And we are creating comparison and competition and division. And we're going to conquer one over the other. And as a result of it, relationships are therefore tarnished. And it becomes just normal that I'm going to get one up against you. And I'm going to be finding a way to you know, take advantage of you. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to lie. I'm going to maneuver as long as I can twist the law to get my way. Because that's what it is. You know about the loopholes of the law. There's always a loophole. However, if you have the spirit of the game and we are surrendered to the spirit, we don't need the law because we will fulfill the law. The law will be a reminder to say we've fallen from its spirit. And that's the good news. The good news is that this spirit of the game is where life is found up front before we engage with it. And it is expressed throughout as we engage with it. And it just bubbles over and bubbles over. And we share that love and that life of the game one with the other. And that's the beauty of playing, playing the game in a spirited fashion. We're playing it to enhance the relationships. We grow in a relationship with each other on the basis of this commonality, the love of the game. The game has given us that. And that's why we refer to it as mother cricket. It's like it's birthing new things to us all the time. And we are so constantly being given fresh life and fresh experiences. It doesn't get stale because life is a fluid, continuous engagement one with the other, just like its spirit. However, the law is rigid and they will find fault with you and say, yes, you're fine. Go and pay your fine. And once you've paid your fine, you can come back into the game. And then people feel crusty. They feel rigid. They feel separated. They don't feel like they really want to engage with each other. And then they make polarizing attempts at uh, enhancing those divisions. Sure. I, uh, I, I got lost in what you said there, uh, just because I think you said all of that so well. Um, and, and I, I mean, in particular, I, I have a belief that there are two, the, the foundational elements of the mental game, right? The foundational elements of that is two things. The first thing is to play the game for the love of playing the game. Not, 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 not just playing the game because you love the game. Playing the game for the love of playing the games. I love being, I love being here. I love being on the field. I love everything that comes with it say the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, because those could potentially just be human error. I love the competition. I love challenging myself. I love being up against it. I love being shown my weaknesses. I love being able to have moments where I express my, where I can express myself with freedom and, you know, like dominate perhaps even, but it's always because I love doing that, not because I'm wanting to get one up or I need something from anywhere else. That's a foundational building block. Like if you can arrive at any game with that attitude, like you are setting yourself up in my mind in a big way. And that's really difficult because it means you have to let go of a whole bunch of stuff. You can't want performance. You can't need a career. You can't need money in the bank, a bigger house, a bigger car. You, like you can't, because as soon as you want those things, you open that door, you no longer have this other door in play. It's just not there anymore. It disappears, right? Um, and, and the second part is the thing that I, I suppose I've spoken about a lot is that idea of becoming insanely good because it sets up our ability to deal with failure and 
wanting to learn and grow and evolve, which is a huge part of the game, right? And this conversation is not initially about that side, but yeah, I just think like I'm sitting here and I'm excited because I'm like, you can't go wrong with this. Like if you make it about the laws, you can go right and wrong. But with the spirit of the game, if that's your starting point and the love that you have and the love that you have with actually playing the game, and, and playing the game, it could be for an umpire, umpiring. It could be for a person spec on the side. I love watching the game, right? You go watch the game because you're doing it for the love of watching the game. Spectators that argue and fight with each other and start hitting each other. That's not in the spirit of the game. Two coaches that have animosity between them. That's not in the spirit of the game. And believe me, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not in the right. I've, I, I think I've harmed a whole, a whole lot of relationships through, the, through this game. I've gained some, but I've definitely, there's some relationships that I look on and I, I go, damn, I stuffed up there. You know, I know a whole bunch of coaches at a certain club where I was at at one point in time. I, I don't know if I was the most well-liked person there. We were excellent. We, we were, I look at some of the stuff the club's achieving at this point in time. I know a lot of that was built on sort of the foundation I lay. But there were certainly moments that I could have been kinder with certain coaches, as an example. There's certainly moments where I could have had a standard and shown more care, right? And, and I think it's maybe it's my personal evolution as a human being and as a person, but I, I've, I realized the importance of relationships. Right? And right now where I'm at, I'm very protective over them. Like, you don't mess with my relationships, right? And I wouldn't want to mess with them. I'll go out of my way to remedy a relationship. And I, and I think that if you, if you, if, if as a, so I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is I get a sense personally about the importance of this because I've seen it in my own life, right? I've seen now if I'm, how that changes the game. You know, if, I, if, 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 if you can, if you're able to manage that a lot better. And so I thank you, man. I thank you for this first conversation that I think is so important. And I'm, uh, and I'm excited for the further ones that we're going to have, right? And may they continue as long as, as long. And I'm hoping that other people get value out of this as much as I do and as much as you do, you know, because we're bouncing ideas here and we're sharing, um, you know. Yeah, I don't know if you've got any final thought to to throw out there for this conversation yeah just to wrap up because um i think i'm excited to get into the next phase this was really a setup conversation uh, the the threats of firstly we're wired to flow by the spirit but we're so it's unconditioned right now because we've been given a different form of reality so that's the first thing we are wired to actually flow into the spirit and with relational equities and secondly uh, i'll we'll disclose some of these uh, threats to the spirit of the game Therefore, when we understand those things, we can navigate it to enhance the flow. Because as you were rightly saying earlier, when you come from scarcity, you're not necessarily going to have peak performance and therefore uh, satisfying relationships as a result of the game. You're not going to be able to feel the love of the game. But when you have the love of the game already flowing over and you already have life flowing over, this expression, you're naturally going to come and share that with each other. So therefore, it's going to enhance the relationships. So I'll unpack a little bit of how those threats come into play and how we can navigate past those in the next session when we chat. And um, that will create a Looking bit more enthusiasm and life too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. Awesome. Russell, thank you very much. Love this chat. Cheers, man. Cheers.